This is the Al Franken Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Hi, everybody. Uh, we got a great one today, you know, for a change. Today, my guest is Hendrik Hertzberg from The New Yorker. But that's not why this is a, a great one. I mean, I, Rick is an unbelievably well-respected writer for The New Yorker. has been for decades. He's won all these awards. He's been winner of the National Magazine Award three times. But the reason he's here today and why this is a better-than-usual interview is that Rick has been a champion of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Now, basically, what that is, is it's a way to guarantee that the winner of the popular vote in a presidential election will become the president. In other words, everybody's vote counts. And I'll explain the national popular vote interstate compact in a couple minutes. And then we'll have uh, Rick do a better job of explaining it. That's that's what we're doing today. But first, I, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, Gordon... Sondland, our nation's ambassador to the European Union, who a couple days ago reversed his testimony about whether President Trump had presented a quid pro quo to the Ukrainian president. Now, originally in October, when he testified to investigators, he said that, no, there was not a precondition placed on our giving the $391 million of military aid to uh, Ukraine. But a couple days ago, Sondland returned and said that there were, in fact, conditions uh, placed on that aid. And uh, uh, the condition was that Ukraine would have to do an investigation into the uh, supposed corrupt activities by Joe Biden and his son Hunter, Obviously, so that President Trump could use that dirt in his reelection campaign against Joe Biden because he assumed Joe Biden would be the nominee. Of course, he could be the nominee, so it's not a waste of time to do a quid pro quo, even if Biden isn't the nominee. You know, that's how smart Trump is. So, evidently, after checking his notes, uh, Sondland realized that his testimony had been wrong. It also might have had something to do with the fact that everybody else <laughs> who testified said the same damn thing, which was it was a quid pro quo. Uh, Mr. Sondland, of course, is not a career diplomat. He is a wealthy hotelier. Uh, he owns a chain of hotels called the Counterintuitive Hotels. It's all those hotels where the, the outlets are behind the couches and uh, where it's impossible to figure out how to, how to turn off the music that's on when you arrive to make your arrival more pleasant, but you can't figure out how to turn the damn music off. If you travel a lot, especially on, on you know, business trips, you'll know that uh, counterintuitive is growing every day. Uh, they're the hotels where you have to slide your room key, the plastic room key, in a slot on the wall, a slot that's on the wall, uh, to turn the lights on. And good luck uh, finding the slot in the dark. That's all I can say. Anyway, he's been a big success after starting this counterintuitive chain. I got to say, I have a lot of concerns about what Trump has done to the Foreign Service. He, he gave, uh, this guy Sondland gave a million dollars to Trump, but he waited till after the election. He was hedging his bets. He gave a million bucks to the inaugural slush fund. You know, Trump was thinking like, how am I going to make money as president? Well, you know, why not start on day one? So this guy is our ambassador to the European Union. You know, talk about counterintuitive. So 
Of course, the career people have been appalled with Trump since day one, but they haven't said anything until this quid pro quo. There's no question what happened here. Is this our Republican senator is going to vote to impeach him? And Trump himself uh, just uh, yesterday said, I could shoot a guy on Fifth Avenue and not be impeached. I don't think the Republican senators will, will mind that. You know. Well, let's go to the subject at hand today, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And it basically says whoever wins the popular vote for president becomes the president. So, for example, in 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by about 3 million votes. They may have all been undocumented immigrants who uh, risked uh, being arrested and deported by going into a <laughs> a, a polling place and uh, breaking the law, or not. So Hillary would have won, and uh, we would not have Gorsuch. We would not have Kavanaugh. We might be addressing climate change. Well, you know. And in 2000, uh, Gore. Gore would have won because he won the popular vote. George W. Bush uh, would not have been president. So what happens is if we get enough states with enough electoral votes, with 270 electoral votes to sign on to this interstate compact, then they all agree. They all agree that they will give their electors to the one who got the most votes. So you don't have to amend the Constitution. Colorado, uh, the legislature did this. They passed this uh, legislation, and the governor signed it. So their electors would go to the winner of the popular vote. Now, uh, a number of Republicans have decided this is kind of scary. You know, if, if Gore had been president in 2000, if Hillary had become president in 2016, and I'm assuming here that, that Gore would have been reelected, but the Supreme Court would be now 7-2 appointed by Democrats. Okay, so the Republicans, uh, there are some Republicans for this because they know that if every vote counts, more people will get involved. And we want a democracy where people are actually involved, not just people in battleground states, not just people who, whose October is hell because if they watch TV, they see nothing but ads. There are like seven or eight battleground states and the rest of the country, really, no one campaigns there. So no one campaigns in California. There's no rallies in Texas during the general election. There's no rallies in anywhere but the battleground states. And this would mean that every vote would count. Now, there's a group called Protect Colorado's Vote. And they want everyone to vote no on this uh, national popular vote compact. This is part of their argument. This end run around the Constitution. Well, no, it's not an end run around the Constitution. If you go to your Constitution, here, go get your Constitution out, everybody. I'll wait. I'll wait. <clears throat> I don't know where you keep it, but, uh, okay, I'll give you a little bit more time to get your Constitution. I keep it at the bedside table and... Uh, but, you know, some people keep it downstairs or maybe listening right now in the car. If you're listening in the car, I don't know if you have your glove compartment uh, constitution. I do, of course. Okay, so you go to Article 2, uh, Section 1, and it says, Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. There's nothing in the Constitution about all your electors have to 
go to the winner of your state's vote. So basically what they have argued is this takes away the people of Colorado's voice. Well, the people of Colorado voted for Hillary Clinton. I get mad. Okay, the National Popular Vote Bill, this bill, this compact, uh, has been enacted by 16 jurisdictions with 196 electoral votes. So it's states like Delaware and Hawaii, like small states, uh, medium-sized states like Connecticut and Maryland and Massachusetts and New Jersey, you know, and big states like California and Illinois and, and New York. They're about, uh, they, they're 75 electoral votes short. And, you know, like Virginia, Virginia just switched. They could pass that this year, this coming year. Now, people will say, Al, why, why, why you care so much about this? You know, this won't affect the 2020 election. But, you know, there's a future, everybody. There is. There are years that happen beyond 2020. We want to make sure that uh, Americans are involved in our elections. So Minnesota, we all we need to do is pick up the state Senate, and then we got the governor, and the, we got the House, and then we got the state Senate, and we could pass this thing. That's what this is. So if you don't understand it now, it doesn't mean you're not smart. It means I'm bad at explaining things. Uh, Rick Hertzberg will be on, and then you'll get it. Then you'll get it. But this has been entertaining, right? In, in, in some small way. And I'll tell you, uh, this is something I have to disclose. I have to disclose this to you. I'm going to get paid to try to raise money for this thing. I'm going to go to different cities. They'll pay for my travel. They'll, they'll give me a per diem kind of thing. And I'll finally be able to, to buy Diane Feinstein's home. I've had my eye on that place. And I wanted to I like my place in Minnesota, but I wanted, she's got a great place here in D.C., and this is going to finally uh, give me the nut that I need. Well, anyway, so that's it. Uh, the, uh, go to the music. So this is about this national popular popular vote. Vote compact. Inter- interstate, interstate compact. compact. Right. Okay. So the problem with uh, getting rid of the Electoral College, which American actual citizens have been have favored for 100 years or more, 150 maybe, is that it's been believed that you have to amend the Constitution. And that is so hard because you've well, got to get it. Yeah. You know, because in the Constitution, I'm sure our founding fathers wrote in that uh, each state... Uh, must uh, appoint appoint electors to vote for the people who win the popular vote in their state. That must be part of it. No, it isn't. Like a winner-take-all kind of thing. I bet you, I bet you starting at the first presidential election, that must have been uh, what they did, huh? Right, except wrong, because uh, they didn't all start doing that for about the fir- until about 30 years in. And... Th- the idea was the Constitution says that the state legislatures shall appoint electors equal mm-hmm. to the number of representatives and senators in that state. And we can get into why they did that. Mm-hmm. So it says in the actual Constitution of the United States, it's called the United States Constitution, mm-hmm. Article 2 in Section 1, uh, it gives the states exclusive control over awarding their electoral votes. And this is a quote. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the state legislature to determine the, the manner in the Constitution. Yeah, and it's been done in all kinds of different ways. And as recently as the year 2000, you may recall, the Republican legislature in Florida came pretty close to just 
voting to give the electors to Bush. Now, they didn't have to, thanks to the Supreme Court. But they, <laughs> they, could, have, them, yeah. they could have do, done it, and it would have been perfectly constitutional. The basic idea here is that you get enough states to sign on to this thing. And right now, there are quite a number of states with quite a number of electoral votes. I think that there are 16, well, 15 states in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. have passed this thing. Mm-hmm. And they have a, a, a total of 196 electoral votes. What's happening this year is the I think it's the Republicans are worried about this because the last two elections where the winner didn't actually get the plurality of the votes were Bush in 2000 mm-hmm. and and this guy Trump, our, our, our current president, uh, in 2016. He got three million fewer votes than Hillary Clinton, although, according to him, uh, they were all (laughs) um, fraudulent votes cast by undocumented immigrants. Yeah, in California mainly. (laughs) Yes, and and that uh, he appointed a uh, a voter fraud commission led by uh, Chris Kobach. They must have found a lot of funny (laughs) business there, huh? so much that they seem to have all fainted away well they disbanded after successfully finding the three million (laughs) no they didn't find any did they not a single one huh okay well anyway should i just explain what the national popular vote interstate compact is and does that would be great okay it's an identical law identically worded law that each compacting each state that wants to go along with this passes, which says, as you noted, that the electors for the candidate winning the national popular vote in our state gets the electors for our state. Right. So that way the constitutional directions are followed to the letter. You don't have to change a word of the Constitution. You don't have to go there. So for those people who thought, like, we're never going to change the stupid electoral college thing where the way it's been working so that you have the person who gets the most votes may not win. (laughs) We can never do that because you need, what, three-fifths of the states to amend the Constitution, and the small states get the two votes from their two senators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Wyoming... (laughs) Uh, gets uh, these three votes, and California, which is, I don't know how many times bigger than Wyoming, but certainly 40 or 50 times, I would think, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If not more, uh, doesn't get 40 or 50 times as many electors. No, and it was a dirty deal. It was an embarrassing deal. Madison was certainly embarrassed by it. Uh, and it had nothing to do with anything really except um, it, it had to do par- partly with Rhode Island being a, a small state. And so what Rhode Island was afraid they're going to be pushed around cause, because they, they were so little. But what this is, is if you get enough states where their electoral votes add up to uh, 270 mm-hmm. to sign on to this compact. Mm-hmm. They all agree that they will all they will all give their electors to the winner of the popular vote. Or they will designate the slate of electors representing the candidate with the most votes in the whole country. Right. So instead, in in, in two thousand, we would have had Al Gore then win the election. Yeah, and the and planet the planet would not be doomed. <laughs> yes, there's that. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> and, you know, I think I think it's fair to say that Bush did not do a great job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'd say that Bush, and this is kind of controversial, so far, anyway, if you measure Trump, in many ways, Bush is worse than Trump. It's hard to say that because I see him... Uh, I see Trump unraveling democratic norms, Mm -hmm. and it's very, very, very frightening. 
and what we're seeing right now with Foreign Service going around them and having <laughs> uh, Giuliani <laughs> conduct our Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, the only way really that that Bush Jr. outdoes Trump is in killing people. Well, there's that. But there's also the economy. Let's remember, I mean, Trump uh, passed this awful tax cut, weighted very heavily toward those at the top. But you're old enough to remember this and you can't believe it. But President Clinton handed off a surplus. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that just astonishing to think about? It's a little a little known fact. He handed off, and and Alan Greenspan said there was actually a danger of us just paying off our entire debt, and if that happened, you couldn't sell bonds. I mean, (laughs) that would create chaos. (laughs) <laughs> so he had to do a, a tax cut in order to make sure that the disaster of paying off our entire national debt didn't happen. <laughs> Literally, that's what Alan Greenspan said. Mm-hmm. And that's what George Bush agreed with. And then we had this enormous tax cut. Then we started getting bigger deficits than we had had at any time during Clinton. And then he handed off an economy where 800,000 people a month were losing jobs. Mm. And he really took his eye off the ball on Al-Qaeda. I think you can argue that Al Gore uh, would have paid attention uh, far more than George Bush did, George W. Bush, because George Bush, W. Bush paid no attention, mm. and Condi Rice paid no attention. She she was going to give a speech somewhere, I think at, at Georgetown that day on her national defense challenges, and it, it, her whole big thing was missiles, rockets and miss, <laughs> missiles. Uh, and then they went to war by lying to us in Iraq. Well, they used the wrong tool for the job. I mean, the job you you had a you had nine eleven. You had the twin towers destroyed by a few scruffy post teen fanatics armed with what letter openers or or some such. Yeah. The answer to that was not a huge conventional war killing thousands of people. It was the wrong tool Hundreds for the job. Of Hundreds of thousands. It was. It, it was pretty obvious right from the start that that was the wrong tool for the job. It was, he had weapons of mass destruction. He had participated in 9-11 Saddam. I don't want listeners to get the impression that the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is a Democratic <laughs> plot. It's not, it's... There it's, are Republicans who, who are, are voting for this because they think it makes sense that the president should be the person who gets the most votes. Yeah, it's not just that. It's also because all but a dozen states are completely left out of the presidential election. Now, it's only a few battleground states that any attention is paid to, that any money is spent in, that any organizing is done. And so the legislators from those flyover states, those nothing states, they can't get their phone calls returned during the general election campaign. Nobody cares. The, the national candidates don't care about them. They don't go visit their states. They don't pay any attention to their needs. Uh, the only states that get anything out of the current arrangement really are the are the few battleground states, the states that are lucky enough uh, or unlucky enough to be subject to a, to a campaign. And even worse, I think, is that organizing, political organizing, and get out the vote drives and and talk to your neighbors about who to vote for are completely pointless in four-fifths of the country. In New York, in California, in Texas, in Mississippi, in all these states, what's the point of even having a presidential campaign or paying attention or, for that matter, voting? Well, if you look at where the events are, like campaign events, they during are, a presidential election they are only in battleground states that's right they are only in battleground states 
And there are a lot of other interests are, that are bothered by that. If you're if you run a television station, you're not getting those ad, lucrative ads. If you're a politician, if you're watching TV, <laughs> you don't get to see wall to wall ads like they do in the battleground states. Yeah. You know, maybe the battleground states would go like, "Holy shit!" You mean they can <laughs> they they have to spend their money in California, and and instead of us seeing nothing but these things, <laughs> so so the people in the battleground states would stand to benefit a little bit. They'd be able to watch TV mm -hmm. <laughs> in October. Yeah. And so, they also get more, you know, the battleground states get all get lots more federal money. They get lots more projects. Yeah, you know, they like a declared like a presidential disaster area. Mm -hmm. The data there is like they get twi <laughs> twice as many events designated as uh, disasters. That's and right. and then they get the money for that. And that makes a big difference. There is a way of determining that, but there is a lot of gray area. Mm -hmm. And if you have a flood, you know, it, it being declared a national disaster, a presidential disaster, means a, an incredible amount in terms of getting homes paid for, getting crucial infrastructure, repaying all the people that had to work during that time to deal with it and we we held our breath a lot of times after a lot of events and minnesota at that time was not considered a battleground state until i think people were surprised in 16 mm. that it was yeah and so minnesota will get some attention in the coming campaign all right <laughs> trump has already uh, been there mm. Mm. and said he was going to win it but he's not he's not going to win minnesota because and i'll tell you why last time it was just we want to change and i think this time there'll be another we want to change people treat the status quo as if it was laid down by the founders and that, that this is the way they wanted it to go uh, it just wasn't I mean, one of the things that bugs me about all, the, all these debates is the way everybody refers to the Federalist Papers as holy writ. And they're great. The Federalist Papers are great. But they are political pamphlets written to sell a particular compromise. And a lot of the elements of that compromise, the people who wrote the Federalist Papers hadn't agreed with. You know, Madison thought the best way to elect the president would be by the popular vote of everybody in the country or everybody who was eligible. And, and Hamilton uh, liked the electors. He didn't say it should be winner take all. No. In fact, Hamilton originally wanted to annihilate the states. He wanted to get rid of the what these these artificial bodies called states and have uh, one nation. He wanted, he wanted to get rid of the states. I mean, maybe they would have kept them for reasons of the the post office or postal addresses or something. He wanted it, us to be a, a unified state, a unified country like France or England or, or what have you. They, yeah, we don't, we don't want that. No, we don't want that, but Hamilton did want that, yet he wrote very eloquently uh, against it. They because had, they, he was defending the Constitution. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, they made all their compromises in writing the Constitution, and then they said, you know, this is so much better than what we've got. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't have everything I wanted, and it. it's got some things I don't like. But let's go out and sell it, because it's the best hope for the country. That's how we started. The framers uh, were not just God sitting up on a cloud handing down wisdom. They were practical men, practical politicians, practical statesmen who owned slaves well that the slavery was a big deal and in fact madison admitted uh, at what one point he put it very delicately he said that one the problem with the popular election of the presidency is that it doesn't take account of the slaves basically uh, the slave states one of the population that your representation in the lower house in the in the house of representatives 
would be based on the total human population, you might say, all the all the people, free and, and slave. And the compromise was the three-fifths thing. And the compromise were the three-fifths. And, of course, the, the free states hated that. They thought if the Southerners really thought that the slaves were property, then they shouldn't get any credit for that in the representation of the House. They said, you count your slaves, we'll count our cattle. Now, that sounds brutal, uh, but it, it's a recognition of reality. Uh, this is all fake history, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Those yes. are fake notes. Yeah, fake, we, fake news with long shelf life, yeah. <laughs> what we're talking about now here is what's going on in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Colorado's legislature passed the the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Mm -hmm. And Colorado, both houses of the legislature voted for it and the governor signed it. And now Republicans are looking at this and going like, geez, they only would need another 74 or 75 Electors and and like we're having this conversation the day after the elections in um, Virginia and Mississippi and and uh, Kentucky and Virginia now has both houses have turned Democratic and have a Democratic governor. There's no reason that they may not do this. And and again, you're absolutely right. There are states in which. State legislatures, the Republicans have very heavily voted for this because it just makes sense. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean, there are a lot of Republicans out there who think that counting the votes and giving the job to whoever gets the most is a, actually a really good idea. Unfortunately, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact thing has gotten has gotten mired in partisanship because Republicans suspect, think that they have been the beneficiaries of the ludicrous way we uh, elect presidents on the merits. Republicans and Democrats have an equal interest in a rational electoral system, an electoral system that awards the office to the candidate that comes in second rather than first is a bad electoral system. And I've noticed that nobody seems to want to transfer the electoral college system to any other part of our democracy. You don't you don't have anybody suggesting that well let's elect the governor by giving let's give each county 10,000 extra votes. <laughs> just just to, to begin with. And that's uh-huh. that would be a better way. That way the the little counties won't be swamped by the big counties. Again, the reason why we have this two-step system cuz we were perfectly able to elect uh, in the post-colonial days, in the early days of the Republic, we were perfectly able to elect uh, members of Congress and local officials and mayors and all the rest uh, by the usual method of counting the votes and giving the job to whoever gets the most. Uh, but in some cases, state legislatures were appointing senators, y- right? Yes, they were. And interestingly, the popular election of senators came about in much the same way as the national popular vote thing. State legislatures passed bills saying the job will go to whoever gets the most votes. The Constitution has the senators appointed by the state legislatures, but the state legislatures could do it any way they like. So so even before it was in the Constitution, there were states electing their senators by popular vote. And for that matter, there were states that let women vote before the constitutional amendment. I think Wyoming. That's right. It was Wyoming. God Wyoming. Bless them. Uh-huh. A voter in Wyoming is going to have just as much influence as a voter in New York or California under the national popular vote. And let's face it, that shouldn't be the case. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to I want to read you something that uh, this is Protect Colorado's Vote has mm-hmm. put out some stuff and they, they want to get rid of what the state legislature and passed and the governor signed. And this is a quote. This end run around the Constitution, which just, it isn't. It is not an end run around the Constitution. That's like saying that an end run in football is a, is a way of avoiding the rules of football. An end run is a, legit, <laughs> is a legitimate play in football. 
That's how they start. This mm-hmm. end run around the Constitution, which it just absolutely is not, mm-hmm. requires Colorado's presidential electors to cast their votes for the candidate for president who received the most votes nationally, even if that candidate did not receive the most votes in Colorado. Now, if you go back to the last election, Colorado, most people in Colorado voted for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So Colorado (laughs) voters voted for Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton won the national vote, but the voters of Colorado did not get what they wanted. Their view was not reflected in this system. Well, they, the voters of Colorado, um, were just irrelevant. Uh, nobody, it didn't matter who they voted for. That was the situation in Colorado. Well, well, well I mean, Hillary got her electors. Hillary got her electors. Um, I don't think Col- was Colorado even even uh, in the in the category of a battleground state. I'm I not- think it was for a while, but then toward the end, it was uh, taken for granted. I think that it was blue, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's kind of turned blue. Cory Gardner is uh, against the uh, national popular vote, but I don't think he'll be in the Senate after this one. Uh-huh. But that doesn't matter. We have to do it this way. In order to get this thing enacted, Mm -hmm. enough state legislatures have to say, this is what we want to do. We want this compact. We want the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Right. And the governor signs it. If those states get 270 electoral votes, then it takes effect. And those states are bound to give their electors to whoever wins the popular vote. Or another way of putting it is that uh, the candidate who receives the most votes in every state and the District of Columbia in the whole country gets to be president no matter what state you live in. Your vote is just as good in a flyover state as it is in a so-called battleground state. So someone may come... And, and campaign in Missouri. In Missouri, you might even want to have a little coffee clutch with your neighbors and invite them over and try and persuade them to vote for your candidate. It's not just that the top will be more uh, active, that the, that the campaigns, the national campaigns, will be sending uh, representatives to, to every state. And it's not just that the TV stations in every state are going to be worth advertising on, uh, no matter where. The Senate is becoming undemocratic because of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we're seeing in the Senate is soon 75% of Americans will live in, what, I don't know, 13 states or something like that. So in other words, like, it's something like 30% of the population will have two-thirds of the, of the uh, Senate. Of the senators, right. And if you look at, I guess, the popular vote, I I don't know if anybody ever bothers to add this up, but the total popular votes for Republicans versus Democrats is overwhelmingly now, I think, for the You're talking about Congress. For Congress, Congress, yeah, Yeah. for the Mm -hmm. House and the Senate is largely, I mean, is is a pretty solid majority Democratic. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had to win, for example, in 2014, there were far more votes for Democrats for House seats than Republicans, but they had the majority of House members, and some a lot of that was because of uh, gerrymandering. Yeah. What you were saying is, and this is really important, is that more people will vote. People won't not vote in California because, why, you know, why do this? Yeah. You know, why bother? We know where this is going to go. And that's people from both sides, right? Uh And the same thing in D.C. and the same thing in Wyoming. Why vote? Look at the turnout in the battleground states versus the spectator states. And it's undeniable the turnout is just much higher in the battleground states. And if we had a battleground nation, 
the, the turnout would be enormous compared to what it is now. And, and people would pay more attention and people would be more engaged. And I think that's good. Uh, I think we all agree that's good. I think so. And every place would be in play. And this idea that it's an end run around the Constitution, it's well, that ahistorical. Well, is not true. Well, it's literally, literally not true. Literally but... not true. Right. But people seem to think that the status quo is mandated by the Constitution, the status quo of winner take all by state. It isn't. And it wasn't the way it was for the first several decades of the of the I believe country. all our founders were dead by the time that was adopted. And you will, you know, there'll be rallies in California. Mm -hmm. There'll be rallies in Texas. There'll be rallies in, should I name lots of states <laughs> now? Or do you get the point, everybody? <laughs> I think you do. But I'll name some other states. There'll be, there'll be rallies in Oregon. We know where Oregon's going to vote. But, you know large parts of Oregon are Republican. Why wouldn't a Republican or conservative candidate you know, have a big rally in Bend, Oregon? Right? Mm -hmm. If you don't like partisanship, this is a great reform. The reason we have this winner-take-all by state thing is that after 20 or 30 or 40 years, we had political parties, which we did, really didn't have at the beginning. And if your party was in control of a state legislature, you didn't see why you should share this bounty with the other party. Just grab it all for yourself. So w hence, winner take all. And winner take all is not in the Constitution. It's not even in the re in reality because there are two states that don't do winner take all. I guess that's uh, Maine. And Nebraska. And Nebraska, right. They do it by congressional district plus the mm -hmm. extra two statewide. Uh, which isn't a particularly good way of doing it, but it's it, it illustrates the fact that there's not holy writ that says it's got to be all or nothing. It's when the parties figured out, when the partisanship emerged and a majority party in a state said, wait a minute, we can take it all. We can just pass a law here where we get all the electors well, and they, they get also, none. We, we can get it all like in Pennsylvania when they draw up the lines for congressional districts. They gerrymander so that Democratic congressional candidates, House candidates, will win a majority of the votes, but the delegation will be two to one Republican yeah, and, in the and House. If we do get popular vote, I think we can start, then we can start thinking about ways to do something about that, not just by laws saying don't gerrymander, but by doing things like having three-member congressional districts instead of single-member districts, spreading it around like that. I mean, th there's nothing unconstitutional about any of that. There's nothing in the Constitution that sa ha says you have to have single-member districts. You can figure that. Each state can decide what, what to that, do it any way they mean? want. What does that mean? Is that these districts are three times bigger? Yeah, the d districts would be three times bigger. Almost every district, you'd be able to vote for someone who would go to Washington. If you were the minority in, the, in one of those three member districts, you'd be likely to win one of the three seats. If it was overwhelmingly one side uh, or the other in that three member district, they, that one party might get all three. But most of the time it would be two and one. And then you notice that, that, that one job, that the job that, that Congress people really do well is representing is constituent representation like helping you helping people out with uh, their hassles with the VA or something like that sure what you don't have is somebody that's representing your political point of view if you had three member districts you'd you'd have a pretty good shot Having somebody electing there somebody who somebody who represents your political philosophy I, I'll bet you there are listeners who are saying like I don't like yeah, boy, that seems strange. And but remember, listener, in life, haven't you had things and gone like, "Oh, that's that. I don't like that now." And then, you know, a couple of years later, you go like, "You know, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I like that." They did. Well, they yeah. had three-member districts? Yeah. I mean, Republicans assume that they do badly under the system for for obvious reasons. But nobody knows how. No, well, this goes back and forth because we thought 
the Democrats thought we had the blue wall. Mm -hmm. So we thought we had Pennsylvania, we thought we had Michigan, we thought we had Wisconsin. And so we didn't need to win the popular vote. I I actually, if you look at this, uh, John Kerry got, I think, a couple million fewer votes, or maybe not that big a margin, but George uh, W. Bush got more popular votes than Kerry, but Kerry came within, I don't know, like less than 50,000 in Ohio to winning the presidency. Yeah. So this cuts both ways. We draw such bad lessons from it. I mean, JFK won the popular vote by around 100,000, and that's only if you count uh, unpledged electors in Alabama. Imagine if, if Nixon had beaten John F. Kennedy, what the lessons of that, what were the lessons of 1960? That people would say, well, the Democrats, they went and, and nominated this playboy, you know, this pretty boy who, whose idea of a good time, you know, is sailing off of Cape Cod from his palatial estate. And Nixon was a regular, a regular American. Of course, Nixon won. He was a regular American. And that's the kind of lessons that are being drawn from Hillary's quote, loss, unquote. Hillary, what did she get, three million more votes? Explain that. Explain that. Explain that. You can't explain that by saying she was a lousy candidate and and she um, didn't have the common touch and et cetera, et cetera. Her defeat was essentially strategic. You can say that they didn't, that the campaign didn't put enough resources into, into the battleground states. You can say that the campaign paid too much attention to states where the votes don't even count. And what does that tell you? Even if it would come out the other way, if it's just a coincidence, really, that Republicans have benefited lately from this status quo, but it could just as easily turn around the other way. The assumption behind that kind of talk is that there's something more legitimate about having counting up the votes and putting the one in the office that got more votes than anybody else that there's there's a legitimacy to that than for this all of this arcane stuff about red states and blue states. I'm in a blue state and I'm blue, but I got neighbors and friends and relatives who are red. This is their state too. And this is their country too. I and... think that's incredibly generous of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're you're a good good man. <laughs> Well, no, w- but of course, of course. Mm-hmm. So what happens is, is more people vote. It makes for a healthier civic atmosphere to have regular elections. And if this if this system is so great, I challenge its defenders to tell me why they don't believe in imposing it on the rest of our public offices, if it's so wonderful. Well, I hope we've done this right. I hope people understand what this is which is basically saying we figured out a way totally constitutionally, totally in line with what the founders wanted, totally in line with what makes sense to say whoever wins the popular vote is elected president, like with pretty much everything else. That's what we were saying, right? Yes, that is, that's what we're saying. Okay, there, there, we've said it. <laughs> All of this stuff is a little bit of uh, civics that uh, and history that uh, Americans maybe have lost a little touch with. But I don't think the, uh, the listeners, I don't, I don't think they suffer from that. Uh, uh, we did a service today. We did. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Al. Okay. Good talking, man. Yep. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing. We'll talk again next week.